Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Gray and I'm a UX developer here at Shopify. Today we're going to be learning how to build a Shopify app with Node and React using the Shopify app CLI, which will enable us to quickly scaffold a Node.js app, as well as helping to automate many common development tasks that we would typically encounter throughout the Shopify app development process. At the end of this video, we'll have built a simple Shopify app that runs in your local development environment. And you should also have the knowledge to get your own app up and running so that you can spend more time working on the problem that your app will actually solve instead of spending a lot of time figuring out necessary and common development tasks that you might run into when building apps for Shopify. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we're going to be building. We'll be building an embedded app with a heading and a button. And when we click on this button, this will open a resource picker that will allow us to select a number of products from our development store. When we select these products, this will console log an array of individual product IDs so that you can use this information to do something like writing a query to the Shopify GraphQL admin API. So let's talk a little bit about the Shopify app CLI, uh, what it is, any requirements that we'll need and how you can install it. So the Shopify app CLI is a command line interface tool built for Shopify app developers, and it enables us to quickly spin up a Shopify app using either Ruby on Rails or Node.js, which is what we'll be using in this tutorial. It will integrate directly with your Shopify partner account, as well as handle authentication when installing your app to a development store. Like I mentioned before, it can also automate common development tasks like populating example data in a development store, such as products or customers. And it can also easily generate boilerplate code inside your app, like a call to the billing API or a webhook. So overall, it's a pretty helpful tool to speed up and simplify your app development process because it can automate a lot of these time consuming development tasks. So now let's take a look at some of the requirements that we'll need to follow this tutorial. First thing that you'll need is a text editor. I'm using VS Code here. You can use whatever text editor that you're comfortable using, uh, like Sublime or Atom. Either of those will work just fine as well. And you'll also need a command line. I'm using iTerm, but again, you can use whatever terminal that you're comfortable using. And for the CLI specifically, before we can install it, you'll need to make sure that you have the requirements there as well. You can find this list of requirements on the Shopify app CLI docs at shopify.github.io slash Shopify dash app dash CLI. And this will be linked in the description box below so you can find it there. So you will need a recent version of Ruby installed and you will also need to have a Shopify partner account. So I am logged into my Shopify partner account here, ready to go. And you'll also need a development store. So a Shopify development store is a free Shopify account. You can create as many of these as you'd like, but you only need one to follow along with this tutorial. So I have my development store here, Jennifer's development store. And if you don't have one, you can create one with the add store button here. And I'm also logged into my development store in another tab here. This is the store admin. So I'm ready to go on that front as well. If you are on Windows, there are a couple more tools that you'll need to have installed before you can install the CLI. You'll need to have the Linux subsystem for Windows as well as Ubuntu for Windows. And once you have all of the requirements, let's look at how we can install the CLI. So the CLI can be installed using a few different package managers. If you are running Mac OS and using the homebrew package manager, there are two commands here that you'll need to run one after the other. And once those have completed, that'll be the CLI installed. And if you are on a Linux based system, there are slightly different installation instructions uh, depending on what package manager you're using. So if you are running the apt package manager, you'll need to install a downloaded DEB file with an explicit version number. And you can grab this from the releases page link here in the docs. And once that's done, you can just run the provided command. Similarly, if you are using the yum package manager, you'll need to install a downloaded RPM file with an explicit version number. And you can also grab that from the releases page link in the docs and then run the provided command. Finally, you can install the Shopify app CLI as a Ruby gem. And again, using the provided command. 
And once you've installed the CLI, you'll want to check that you have the or you want to check that it's been installed correctly. So you can run the Shopify version command. So let's go ahead and do that just now. Type Shopify version in my command line. So it shows that I'm on version 1.0, which is a recent version. So we're good to go. Now this is a really important step, especially if you already have the CLI installed before watching this video, because you might be on the legacy version of the CLI. So in that case, it would show a command not found error here. Uh, and that just lets you know that you're on the legacy version of the CLI. And you'll wanna head to this migrate from a legacy version page in the Shopify docs and follow those steps to do a one-time migration because as of version 0.9, the Shopify app CLI is installed and managed as a software package as opposed to a Git repository. So if you're using that legacy version, you'll just wanna follow these steps to make sure that you can keep using the CLI. We are just about ready to start playing around with the CLI, but before we do, I just want to mention two final requirements that I missed earlier, but they are necessary for continuing on with the rest of this tutorial. So the first one is Node.js. Because we are building a Node app, you need to have Node.js installed. And finally, you will need to have an ngrok account. This can be either free or paid. And the Shopify app CLI uses ngrok to create a secure tunnel from the public internet to your local development app. So once you have all the requirements and you've installed a recent version of the CLI, let's check out some of the core commands. The Shopify help command will list out the available commands and describe what they do. So let's try that out in our terminal. I will type Shopify help and it lists out four commands. Connect to connect to an existing project. Create to create a new project and you can pick between either Node and Rails. Log out to log out of a currently authenticated partner organization and version, which we've already used, and that just printed out the version number. So we want to create a new node, pro a new node project. So I will type Shopify create node, and we're now prompted to type in our app name. You can call your app whatever you'd like. I will name mine something creative, like my test app. And we are now asked what type of app are we building, public or custom? A public app is built for a wide merchant audience. These are sold through the Shopify app store and um, they need to go through a review process before they can be listed there. A custom app is built for a single merchant. They cannot be sold through the Shopify app store and they also don't need to go through the review process. And for this tutorial, let's go ahead and build a public app. So we, are, we now need to install our app onto a development store and the CLI is listing out all of the development stores that I have attached to my partner account. Now I previously showed you my partner account where I had the one developer store listed here. However, I do have a lot of archive development stores. These are just older stores that I've used in the past and then I've archived them because I'm not using anymore. And I was hoping that the CLI wouldn't list them out because some of them have kind of silly names, but they do, so there you go. We will pick our non-archived store, Jennifer's Development Store and it is now cloning into my test app and installing the dependencies with NPM. This might just take a minute or two. All right, dependencies have been installed and my test app was created in my partner dashboard. And there's a link here that we can use to check it out. So this is our partner's dashboard and here is our newly created app, which is great. Now let's go back to our terminal and we can now change into our project folder and run Shopify serve to start a local server. So I will go into my project folder and let's run Shopify serve. An ngrok tunnel was created and we are asked if we want to update our application URL. We will say yes here because we're creating a new app and we want the app URL set to our development URL. So the server is running and we can now press Control T to open this project in our development store. So let's do that, Control T. And this provides us with a URL and I'll just click on this URL. This should take us to our development store where we can now go ahead and install our app. So I'll click this button, install unlisted app. And ta-da, we have an app. 
Right now it's not much, uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But in just a few seconds, it should redirect us to our store admin where the app will be embedded. And here we are inside our development store admin and our app has just loaded up, embedded within the admin, which is awesome. And if you're wondering why we are embedding our app as opposed to just having a standalone app, by embedding your app in the Shopify admin, you can create a great user experience that is familiar and easy to use for Shopify merchants. It also helps you ensure that this experience is consistent no matter where a merchant is using your app. So whether that's on the web or in the Shopify mobile app for iOS or Android. A familiar user experience can build a trusting relationship between your app and your user, making them more likely to recommend your app to others. So now let's go ahead and open up our text editor and we'll take a look at the files that were created with our project. So your project folder uh, was created in a subdirectory of wherever you were located in your terminal at the time of creating your project. So mine is just here in my home folder. And we have quite a few files already in here, but I'll only go over a few of them. So this is our ENV file where you can find your Shopify API key and the API secret. You also have your shop, your access scopes, and the host, which is your ngrok URL. And the Shopify API key and the API secret, you can also find in your partners dashboard. We wanna keep this information in a separate file as we don't wanna expose this information publicly. Next, we have our server files. So we won't be touching anything in these files, but I will just go over what's in here quickly. So we're importing next here from Next.js. And Next.js is a framework for setting up React-based apps. Next.js takes care of some things that you would typically need to do in a React app, like Webpack configuration, hot module replacement, and both server and client-side rendering. We also have Koa being imported here. Shopify apps are authenticated with Open Authorization, or OAuth which is a token-based authorization and authentication system that Shopify uses to securely connect apps to Shopify and merchants. So the Koa middle will work with Koa Shopify auth um, to take care of most of the authentication process and create your custom server. And the Shopify Koa middleware will also securely proxy GraphQL requests from Shopify. We also have this handlers file so our app is set to use um, Apollo to fetch data and the Apollo client and its React components were designed to let you quickly build a React UI that fetches data with GraphQL. So that's what's being set up in here. And we also have this register webhooks file. It's just some scaffolding code to set up registering a webhook. And inside this mutations folder, we have some code that will make calls to the billing API when you're ready to set up billing through your or billing for your app, which you can do through the CLI. So we won't be getting to working with GraphQL billing or webhooks in this tutorial, but that is just a brief overview of what you can find in the server file. So next we have this pages folder. This is what holds our front end components. So Next.js uses an app component to pass down classes to other files in your app. So app.js file, um, it's gonna pass down everything that you would typically find in an index file to the rest of your app. So you can see that there are a few different provider components being imported here, one for Apollo and one for Polaris and one for AppBridge React. And we haven't spoken about Polaris or AppBridge yet, um, but we will be using both of these libraries in a little bit. So I'll talk a bit more about those once we get to actually working with them. So these provider components that are being imported, they're just wrapping our entire app and they're needed in order to use each of these libraries throughout our entire app. And finally, we'll talk about our index.js page. This is the main page of our app, and this is where we will actually be working. So on this page, we can see a heading and a page component being imported from Shopify Polaris. And what exactly is Polaris? Let's open up the docs to find out. So Polaris is a design system built to provide a cohesive experience with consistent patterns across an interface. This cohesive experience relates back to what I spoke about earlier in regards to the benefits of embedding your app within the admin. 
the use of your app should continue to feel like a familiar experience throughout the entire interface, and Polaris will definitely help to maintain this experience. This is invaluable for app developers who are building on our platform and are looking to make interacting with our product easier and more predictable for merchants, as well as conforming to web accessibility standards. So the design system includes a wide range of patterns that you can use to make the best experience for your users. The Polaris docs can walk you through specific content guidelines and wording that you can use. There are design guidelines that you can follow when designing the layout, what colors, typography, etc. that you want to use. And there are also components, which are a collection of interface elements that can be reused across your app. So let's take a look at some of the components that we currently have in use. And we've already seen one in the app.js file. That was the app provider component that was wrapping our app. And here, like I mentioned before, we have our heading and our page component. The heading is being wrapped by the page component and the heading component is what is showing the text that we currently see in our app. So if we go ahead and replace this with some other text and we go back to our app, we can see that our app has now reloaded with the new text, which is great. What we want to do now is add a button to our app. And when we click on this button, it will trigger the opening of a modal that will show us a list of products from our development store. So let's go ahead and add that button in. Now Polaris does have a button component that we'd be able to import here and render it doing something like this. However, let's take a look at the page component and we'll see how customizable that is on its own. So I'll go to the Polaris docs and let's search for the page component. And each component in the Polaris docs will show you an example of the rendered component as well as the relevant code. So looking at this example, it does look like the page component is pretty customizable on its own. We have different headings. There is a button, a breadcrumb. So we might be able just to customize this um, the way we want to. And if we look at this drop down here, we can also see different variations of the page component and their code examples. So I'll look at this example, it's a bit more simple. Um, there's a heading here and a button. So we'll see how we can do this ourselves. So it looks like the orders title is the title prop of the page component and the create order button, this looks like it's the primary action. So if we scroll down, we can see a list of all of the props that the page component will accept. So we have the title here, it accepts a string and the primary action prop, I'll click on it to get some more details. So we probably want to add content, which is just a string, and this will just be the text on our button. And we probably also want to do something when we click on the button. And it looks like this would be on action, which is a callback when an action takes place. Let's try that out in our code. So I'm just gonna get rid of this for now and I'll get rid of these two imports that we don't need. All right, so we wanted to add a title. So we'll call this something like product selector and we need the primary action. So I'll open this up and this, we needed content for the um, text on our button. So we'll say something like select products and the other one was on action. And this was a callback. And for now, what we'll do is we'll just, um, oops, we'll just console log to make sure that when we click, it actually does something. So I'll just console log clicked. All right, so let's go back to our browser and see what happens. All right, so we can now see our page component and it has our product selector title as well as our select products button. And now if I open up the console and I click on the button, we should see the text clicked. Perfect, so it works exactly as we want. And now let's go ahead and trigger the modal to open. And when we open the modal, we want to see a list of products from our development store. 
But if we check out the products page in our store admin, we can see that we don't currently have any products. So let's go ahead and add those and we can easily add some placeholder products using the Shopify app CLI. Let's take a look at the CLI docs and under node app projects and then command reference, we can see another list of commands that you can use specifically when you're creating a Node.js app project. So we will want to use the populate command as that will add example data to our development store. So you can add either products, customers, or orders. So in our case, we will want to use the Shopify populate products command. It will by default to add five items, but you can change the number to whatever you like. Let's go to our command line. I will just stop the server and I'll type uh, Shopify populate products. And we can see here that it is adding the products to our development store. And let's go back to our store. I'll refresh the page. And here we have our five products that we just added. Now that we have our products, let's go ahead and add in the modal. And to do that, we'll use Shopify App Bridge. Shopify App Bridge is a JavaScript library that works with apps embedded within the Shopify admin, just like what we have. App Bridge will help to reduce your development time by accessing native Shopify features, and it makes sure that the user experience is consistent. AppBridge also offers React components, which are already installed because we created our project using the CLI. AppBridge React is also fully compatible with Polaris, so the interface will continue to appear cohesive. Let's open up the Shopify AppBridge um, docs. And these can be found at shopify.dev, and I will link the docs in the description box down below so you can grab them from there. Specifically, let's take a look at the React components. We want to use the resource picker. The resource picker will render a modal that will provide us with a list of resources. So in our case, these resources will be products. From there, you'll be able to select or pick from these resources and then do whatever you want with them. The docs shows us an example of the code and how we can set this up in our own project, as well as a note that says in the following example, you need to store shop origin during the authentication process and then retrieve it for the code to work properly. The CLI already handles this for us, as well as wrapping our project in the provider component. So all we need to do is import the resource picker component in order to use it. Let's also take a look at the props that the resource picker accepts. There are two required props, open and resource type. Open is a Boolean for whether the picker is open or not, and resource type is the type of resource you want to pick between product, product variant, or collection. So we'll want to set this to product. Let's go into our project and add this in. The first thing that we'll want to do is convert our uh, index to a class so that we can set the state for our resource picker for whether it's open or closed. So I'll update this to class index extends react.component. I'll just delete this brace here and we'll add in our render and our return. And let's move our page component to be inside the return here. Perfect. And now let's import our resource picker. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this line here and I'll update page to be resource picker. And we'll want to import this from Shopify at Bridge React. All right, so now let's add our resource picker. Let's add this inside of our page component. So I'll just go ahead and I'll open that back up and we'll add in our resource picker. Perfect. So we'll add in the two required props. The first one was resource type. So we will want to set this to product. And the second one was open. So we want this to, uh, we want to set the state of our resource picker to be open or closed. So let's set this to be this dot state dot open. 
All right, and we'll set the initial state. We'll set this to be open false. And when we click on the button inside of our page, uh, so this is the primary action, we'll want this to uh, update the state to be open true. So we'll change that here. We'll say this dot set state, and we will update this to be open true. All right, so now let's go into our command line. We'll restart the server. So Shopify serve. We'll go back to our app. So back into our store admin, go to the apps page, and we should see our app here, my test app. So I'll click on this and wait for the page to reload. All right, so now when we click on our select products button, this should open up our modal with our list of five products. The resource picker also allows you to search for specific products. And of course you can select from any of these products. And currently when you add a selected product, nothing actually happens. So we definitely want to update this. And you might also notice that if you either close the resource picker without making a selection, or if you add um, a selected product like what we just did, if you try to open up the resource picker again, nothing is going to happen. And this is because the state is still set to open true. So we also want to update the state when we close the picker. Let's take a look back at the resource picker docs and see if we can use any of the available props to make these updates. So the on cancel prop um, is a callback when the picker is closed without a selection. So we can use this to update the state. And the on selection prop is a callback when a selection has been made. It receives a select payload argument, which is an object with ID and selection keys. And the selection key will be an array of all the selected resource. So we can definitely use this. And for now, let's just console log what we get back when we make a selection. So let's go back into our project and make these updates. So first let's add in the on cancel prop. So this will just be a callback function and we'll say this dot set state open false. And next let's add in the on selection prop. And again, it is a call callback function. Uh, it's going to receive a select payload argument and let's just call this resources. And what we'll actually do is let's create a handle selection function and there we can console log our results and we'll also be able to uh, update the state. So I'll say this dot, we'll call it handle selection and I will pass in our resources. All right, and I'll add our function just underneath our render. So I'll handle selection as in the resources. So first let us update the state. So this dot set state. And again, we'll say open false. And finally, we will console log our resources. Now let's go back to our browser and look at what we have. I'll just reload our admin. All right, let's open up our console so that we can see our logged results. I'll just get rid of this warning. It just has to do with a future version of Chrome. And now if we open up our resource picker, let's select blue flower and divine cloud. When we add them, we should see um, our results console logged here. Perfect. So it is an object with an ID and our selection array and this shows our selected product. So we have Blue Flower and Divine Cloud. But you'll likely want to take these products and display them to merchants in some way. And the best way to do this is to target the products by their unique IDs. And you can see these IDs inside the selection array right here. And eventually you would probably want to write a query to the Shopify GraphQL admin API, but first you'll need to create an array of IDs to use in this query. And this is going to be the last step in our tutorial. We'll use map to create this array of product IDs. So let's go back into our code and inside the handle selection function, we'll 
create a const and we'll call it id from resources. And what we want to do is we want to map over the um, resources selection array. So resources.selection.map. And we want to target the product IDs. So product.id. All right, and then instead of console logging the resources, let's console log our ID from resources. And this should give us an array of these IDs. So if we go back into our shop admin, and I'll reload the page, and we'll make sure that we see the right IDs being logged. All right, so let's try this out. We'll open up our resource picker. We'll select our products, however many products we want. We'll click add. And here we see an array of our three product IDs. And you have now built a basic Shopify app with Node and React. You've learned how to use the Shopify app CLI to set up your embedded app. We also used Polaris and AppBridge to build a cohesive interface and grab data from a development store. It is a very simple app, but hopefully this video has given you the guidance that enables you to quickly and easily set up your own app so that you can spend more time focusing on solving a unique problem for merchants. For further resources on the next steps that you can take in your app development journey, check out the description box below. And if you found this video helpful, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. We upload helpful videos every week to support you on your development journey with Shopify. Thanks for watching everyone. Thank you.